So welcome to our session um, live from Beirut at the 2021 Working Internationally Conference. The conference is organised by ICOM UK in partnership with NMDC, with support from the British Council and curatorial support from Barker Langham. And, and thank you to everyone who's, who's helped us put this together. Today we are in Lebanon hearing from Dr Nadine Panayot, who is the relatively new curator at the American University of Beirut Archaeological Museum and an Associate Professor of Practice at the Department of History and Archaeology. I'm Claire Messenger and I'm going to be your host for this session um, and thank you again to all of you for joining us. In 2020, we heard much about the devastation caused by the explosion in the city of Beirut. Um, I'm sure, like me, you remember well the heart-stopping images of the blast and the heartbreaking stories that followed of loss and destruction. Um, in this session, Nadine will be sharing an update on the work currently taking place to deal with the aftermath of the explosion the ongoing global pandemic and, as she reminded me, the final financial crisis that they're also working through. First, though, Nadine has shared two films to introduce you to the Archaeological Museum, the third oldest museum in the Near East after Cairo and Constantinople, and then to look at the then one that looks at the damage caused by the August the 4th explosion. Nadine will then share some information on the challenges and opportunities that she's faced moving their projects and programs online and look at how both local and international networks are helping to support the museum through the crisis. So now we're going to hear the see and hear and see the films. Beirut, a city seven times destroyed, eight times resurrected, and still as resilient as ever. Here, in the American University of Beirut, stands the third oldest museum in the Near East, after Cairo and Constantinople. Nestled inside its walls is a rich collection of archaeological findings that have travelled far and long to find their sanctuary. Like this enigmatic crystal that came from Egypt. Hello there. What have you come here to tell us? Hey, jaw, dental wire, string of gold. What stories have you recounted? Hey, archaeological treasures, what events did you witness? In 1868, General Luigi Cesnola, the American consul in Cyprus, offered the SPC, the Syrian Protestant College, later known as the American University of Beirut, its first archaeological collection. In those days, the collection was displayed in College Hall, the first building on campus. To look after these treasures, the founder of the AUB, Daniel Bliss, 
appointed two curators, Dr. Harvey Porter and Dr. and Reverend George Post. For as long as we can remember, we, warriors of Cyprus, have marched into battle. This spectacular jug once held olive oil. In 1902, the museum's first walls were erected. Post himself worked on the building's architectural plans and then moved his focus onto designing the herbarium. When it opened its doors, the museum showcased its first collection and later added others, including the iconic busts from Palmyra. We symbolize immortality. We came from the oasis of the city, Palmyra. We ceramic sculptures and other manifestations of Islamic craftsmanship were brought back from the dome of the rock in Jerusalem. Throughout the First World War, the college remained open closing only for two weeks in 1917. On the 18th of November, 1920, the Syrian Protestant College was renamed the American University of Beirut. By 1922, I, Harvey Porter, had served the museum for 52 years. And after I passed away, Harold Nelson assumed my position. Nelson was an expert Egyptologist and well-versed in reading hieroglyphics. <laughs> he looked at me with his inquisitive, piercing gaze and saw right through me. He was one of the rare few who had that gift. In 1927, geologist Professor Alfred E. Day took over as curator of the museum. I was fascinated by the Stone Age. During my tenure, I led the excavations in Xara'il I even flew in a team from Boston College to assist me on unearthing potsherds related to 37 different cultures from a sounding 23 meters deep. The oldest one we found dates back 50,000 years. In 1930, Dr. Harold Ingold became curator. Shortly after, Peritus the first archaeological journal of its time was published in the region. In 1932, I surfaced from the earth in the city of Saido. I came to remind the world that dentistry already existed in 500 BC. <laughs> yes, these are golden wires. With the Second World War, the archaeological collections were at risk. Mary Bliss Bayard Dodge, the newly designated curator, took the initiative of moving them into... The Van Dyke Court, the safest place to protect them from the bombing. In 1942, 74 years after the establishment of the AUB Museum, the National Museum of Beirut opened its doors. 
A year later, Lebanon claimed its independence. <laughs> we are amulets that date back to the Phoenician era. Our job was to protect our owners from the evil eye. We made it here thanks to Dorothy. Yes, Dorothy McKay, the new curator. She went to a lot of trouble to exhibit us. In 1951, Dmitry Baramki took over from McKay. I decided to move the botanical, geological and natural history collections out of the museum. This way we had more space for archaeology in the museum. And I made excavation mandatory in the academic field of archaeology at AUB. Did you know that Judas traded Christ for coins like these? I'm a coin specialist. All the coins here are exquisite. I am originally from the temple of Ashtarut in Beritus, or Beirut as you know it today, though my temple still remains uncovered. I am the symbol of Heliopolis, the temple of Baalbek. I go way back to the first and second centuries of the Roman period. I represent Poseidon, god of the seven seas. I am the daughter of Adonis himself. My name, My name is Beroe. I belong to the temple of Marcias, still buried in Beirut. Baramki's curatorship lasted 25 years, during which time hundreds of objects were added to the museum's collection. In 1975, Baramki retired, making way for his young assistant, Dr. Leila Badr, to take over. Badr led the excavation that uncovered the secrets of an intriguing tomb at Tel El Ghazil in the Bekaa Valley. Thanks to my illustrations of birds and palm trees, archaeologists were able to date both me and the person I was buried with back in time to 1700 BC. I accompanied him towards his rebirth in another life. Sadly, the events that began in 1975 created a sea of troubles for Lebanon. The archaeological excavations at Tel Ghazil were halted. The dark days at AUB became even darker with the assassination of President Malcolm Kerr, fatally shot on his way from the museum to his office on January 8, 1984. They were indeed sad days, but despite the chaos that was prevailing, we achieved great things. We started major excavations at Tel Kazel in Syria and at Chabwa in Yemen. In 1980, I launched the Society of the Friends of the Museum, initiative that made archaeology more popular and accessible to everyone. The museum opened its doors to exhibitions, conferences, trips, and welcomed the visually impaired, as well as waves of school children. In 1991, when the war was coming to an end, College Hall collapsed after a car bomb detonated. 
and its towering clock that was once considered everlasting stopped ticking. I then started looking for the cornerstone that was placed in the foundation of College Hall. I was so happy when I found it with a lead box that contained many documents from that day of 1871. When the war was over, reconstruction works began, but archaeology had to proceed. I then took charge of Beirut's ancient tell in 1993. I was so lucky to discover these exceptional jars, the evidence that Beirut was indeed a Phoenician city. In 2006, with the support of the Friends of the Museum, Badr launched the renovation works that gave the museum the look it has today. This renovation has been really fantastic for the museum. It gave this museum a new look. It gave it a new dimension. Objects have been brought together into themes. It attracted lots of people. Students came in large numbers to visit. I'm very lucky and very happy to be here on this special occasion of the 150th anniversary. To celebrate this anniversary is really something. A hundred and fifty years since its founding, the museum stands proud filled with precious findings and timeless heritage. Behind it, all the men and women who worked with passion and dedication. Thanks to them, the story of the museum and its rich collections has been passed down from generation to generation, keeping the history of our ancestors alive and present. These pieces have survived 2,000 years. They've been through the tsunami of Beirut in 551 AD. They have been throughout all the wars, all the attacks, all the bombing. They've been through hell. And now, all it took was one blast, and they're all gone. So what we're going to do is like have a chain so that we minimize the handling of the, of the fragments because they're still very fragile. And uh, we're going to try and identify them at the same time so we can uh, uh, make this process faster. This coming 
together trying to fix something it had a totally unexpected effect on everybody. The museum staff, the curator, the restorer, and even people who were following us live on social media. Basically, everybody felt that it had a healing effect on all of us. Hello, Nadine. Hi, Claire. Thank you so much for, um, for sharing those films and what an amazing history your museum has. Um, can I start off by asking, um, you were there in the days after the explosion. How did you feel walking into that space? What were you thinking? Well, first, allow me to thank you for hosting me, uh, Claire. This really uh, means a lot and it gives us a you know, a feeling of support from the ICOM UK. So thank you. Uh, for, well, I, I went through a variety of feelings and emotions to tell you the truth. Uh, when I first approached the building, I saw that this huge over hundred year old uh, door, it's a massive door had been blown off its hinges. Uh, so as I walked in, I was really expecting the worst. Then as I walked into the museum, I saw that several windows were also shattered. We had a total of about 17 windows. And you know, you have to imagine this, this is a historical building as you saw with very large windows and everything was smashed and I was walking on broken glass. But then I was relieved because I immediately realized that, that, that the door had not crashed onto the Bronze Age and the Phoenician terracotta figurines but instead it had fallen uh, outside into the hallway, which was very surprising at first. Then as I was walking uh, again, I realized that none of the showcases had moved an inch. All the objects inside the, the showcases, nothing had fallen, nothing had dropped. It was just perfectly well aligned. But of course, I was still, you know, holding my breath, walking on, on broken glass. And then I finally reached the end of the museum. And this is when I saw this large uh, showcase that used to contain 74, you know, uh, artifacts, glass artifacts, uh, that it, it was basically smashed face down onto the floor. Well, the feeling was... Uh, as I said, mixed feelings. On one end, I was feeling relieved. And on the other, of course, this, this was a huge loss. It's a priceless loss. But at the time, remember, as you said, this was like few, maybe a couple of days after the blast, we were still re receiving news from friends and family members who had either lost their lives or had been so badly injured that they did not make it a few days after the blast. So you learn to relativize, you know, and you think, well, of course, these are priceless pieces, but at the end of the day, I felt that we were lucky. We got off with minimum damage, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. And did you, did you, um, did you have any way um, to deal with those emotions that you and your colleagues must have all, all been feeling? As you say, the, the terrible personal loss that people were suffering, um, and then also coming into a workspace that was so um, so devastated too. How, how did you support each other? Well, really, frankly, when AUB offered me that position in late spring 2020, I never imagined that this dramatic turn of events would actually take place. Uh, little did I know, for example, that Beirut would soon turn into a crime scene and be staging the third most powerful explosion in the history of the world. 
uh, little did I know that uh, Lebanon would be going through its worst financial economic crisis since its creation. And little did I know back then that uh, the world would actually be bent over this grueling pandemic and that we would reach those peaks of total lockdowns, which we did not reach earlier in Lebanon. So uh, my challenges was, were really all of the above. Um, having, I, I tried to address every issue, security, financial, recovery, restoration, health, with a clear mind. And I tried very much never to give in to fear, despair, or doubt, although all three were constantly roaming. So um, as I said, you learn to relativize and see and look you know, on the positive side of things and try to move forward from there on. Yeah, what, what do you think the biggest challenge was? What was the thing that you found most difficult? Uh, really, I, I would not be able to separate between all three because they all hit me together. <laughs> I mean, simultaneously, it was a huge blow. It was, I always, when I, when I close my eyes, I, I see again that massive door shattered in a thousand pieces. And I keep saying, my God, that massive door took the entire shockwave. And we were lucky, I mean, had it blown inwards, which usually happens with any blast, uh, I mean, just the pieces, the shards from this door would have broken all the, uh, all the showcases in the first gallery of the museum. So somehow you keep telling, you keep saying, I mean, some, I mean, ah, I don't know if you can call them miracles, but I mean, a lot of people survived that blast and a lot of objects also survived that blast. So you, you force yourself to look at the positive side of things to be able to pick up the pieces and move on. Otherwise, you just, I mean, you're just left there in the dark. You can't move, but no, luckily you have to pick up. You have to pick up the pieces and move on. That was it. That was the biggest challenge. You, you were all just so incredibly brave. I, I can't even pretend that I can imagine what, what, it, what it's been like for you. Um, obviously, you and your colleagues uh, have, over the months um, after the blast, were able to maintain a programme of events, lectures, tours, children's programmes. Um, what opportunities have you discovered um, as far as kind of, um, I, I suppose, taking your projects and programmes online uh, with new technology? Well, it was it became immediately clear to me that a new communication strategy had to be developed in order to find the right resources to support the museum in the future. So we we shifted to digital programming and a new communication strategy. And I insist on the word communication because you have to, you know, you have to um, come out to your community. First, the Society of the Friends of the AUB Museum, who are, have always been extremely supportive. Uh, then the AUB community, and of course, uh, third, the national and the international public at large. And it, we had to make a conscious effort to communicate with these people, to tell them what was happening. And uh, going live while during the recovery mission really was a learning uh, experience. We learned a lot from that experience. So all in all, to go back to the digital um, realm, so to speak, we, um, it really did open up new horizons, endless possibilities, diverse partnerships, and interdisciplinary projects. And it was all one fingertip away. This was an amazing shift uh, into the digital world. And I would tell you a little bit of, I mean, after six months of experiencing that, uh, what were the outcomes? First, I think there is one major change that I guess all of us in the museum community have experienced. It's the recognition uh, of the digital sphere as a distinct branch of, of curatorial practices. Uh, maybe that was long overdue. Um, maybe all museums should have dedicated formal digital programming departments from now on. I know I would consider that we don't have that now. We're doing our best. We don't have really a department for digital programming, but we're doing our best with the means on board. 
another advantage uh, turned out to be leaping over bureaucratic and logistical uh, challenges. Uh, we are a university museum, so we usually, especially that we are located in a somehow insecure environment, what Lebanon is going through it has a lot to do with insecurities. So it was always a challenge allowing our visitors into the campus. It's not just they're entering the museum. They first have to cross the gates of the campus and then make it to the museum. So digital, really the digital realm opened up literally uh, endless horizons. Now our visitors can just from their screen or their phone, you know, visit us, be in touch, read our newsletters, read our the articles that we send them, attend the lectures, the programs. This was uh, an amazing um, uh, advantage. And another one, of course, is the low cost of running those uh, public programs. I mean, our first lecture, for example, uh, we, we hosted uh, a professor, our colleague, uh, Professor Green from the Harvard uh, from the Harvard Museum of the Ancient Near East at zero cost. I mean, that's the way it is. Usually, we would have had we would have had to pay for the I mean, for travel expenses, hotel uh, dinners, and and gatherings. You know, all of that took place. We had an amazing and a very uh, inspiring lecture uh, at at no cost. And the beauty of it is that we had followers and we had uh, an audience from all over the world. Uh, Boston, Washington, Paris, the UK, everybody was watching from their homes. So this is, I mean, I like to, again, focus on the positive, positive side of the, what the digital, digital world offered us. Um, so all in all, these were the, the positive outcomes. I can, I can, um, as someone who works with um, uh, international colleagues all the time, I can I can really um, understand what you're saying. This, uh, you know, this period for us when we've been uh, and under COVID restrictions has been so amazing um, for keeping in touch with people in ways that we we just wouldn't have done before. Um, have you had any um, any issues with the kind of, uh, with the digital divide um, uh, dealing with people who maybe um, are not used to working with uh, zooms and computers, whether they don't have the technology, whether they've needed to learn? Um, has, has that been an issue for you? It has been an issue at the beginning, especially with the members of the society. Um, and uh, basically slowly but surely they all learn. I mean, we made accessibility very user friendly. I made sure, you know, every time I organized a, a lecture online, I made sure to ask the IT department not to, for example, you don't need to register. This is very important. Okay, it's, it, it's on one side, it's not, it doesn't sound very professional and it doesn't sound very academic coming from a university museum. But on the other hand, it helped our audience to really click on, you know, just click and enter and join the, the lecture. So I insisted on that until they really picked up on it. And now everybody really uh, just, you know, joins in with zero trouble. So I, think we're, I think we're all really happy to have anything that makes all this technology simple, to be honest. Um, can I ask how, um, whether your local audiences and local communities, what ways they were able to support you? Well, to tell you the truth, uh, prior to taking on my position, i.e. between August 4th and September 1st, I had put together a first aid rescue team with my ex-students who had earned their master's degree in museum studies and cultural heritage management from the University of Balaman. The rescue team volunteered to help all the damaged museums of Beirut. Of a total uh, of eight museums that had been hit, only the AUB and the Sirsok museums suffered damages to their collections with larger numbers for AUB. So our effort really focused on the rescue of the collections. And we let other NGOs and other uh, groups who of volunteers uh, help with picking up the debris, the architectural debris, you know, the glass, the doors, everything. But, you know, since we are a very small group of specialized people, I told them, well, we should help where our help is needed the most. 
and this would be with the collections. Uh, and this is exactly what we did. And after that, we did an assessment, a preliminary assessment, and we put together lists of required material that we didn't have or we could not access because of the economic crisis in Lebanon, uh, required materials for the recovery missions, whether it's for Sursa or AUB Museum. And I contacted then my colleagues and friends at the Institut National du Patrimoine in Paris. And we put together two recovery missions, one for AUB and one for the Musée sur Souk. And uh, basically they were both financed and we're very grateful for that by the International Alliance for the Protection of Heritage, ALIF, which is based in uh, Switzerland. And uh, we received the help uh, that we needed. So basically we got a lot of support from volunteers from around Lebanon, but then we have very limited specialists in Lebanon in terms of restoration. We have very few. And this is why I needed to contact and bring in external help to handle, you know, the manuscripts, the paintings at the Sursuk Museum. Well, they had a, a somebody there in-house already, which was good because their largest collection has to do with, uh, is about paintings and art. But then the rest, manuscript, this is where we intervened and the Institut National sent somebody, a specialist, to handle the, the, the manuscripts. Uh, as for us, we have, well, the one person who could have done the work for us, she was stuck because of COVID outside the country, and so she couldn't even help us. So it was, it was no longer a choice. We had to call in for external help. That's interesting. It's, it's interesting how um, uh, times of crisis, and I think we've probably seen that here in the UK, that uh, people are so good at working together in a way that perhaps we don't always think of doing um, uh, under normal circumstances. And, and it's like you say, I suppose it's about looking at positives. Um, from, from a restoration point of view, um, have you been able to use um, local materials, local craftspeople, local resources in your reconstruction efforts um, uh, in a way that possibly um, was able to support your local community and your local economy as well? Indeed, absolutely. <clears throat> Sorry. Basically, AUB's administration moved swiftly, really, on reconstructing the campus, not just the museum. But of course, and naturally, they prioritized the museum building uh, because of all the uh, <clears throat> heritage that's inside of it. So by the time I took over the position, 1st of September, and by the time we received the visit of international institutions, uh, the museum was fully secured. All five doors had been replaced. The 17 windows had been, you know, uh, replaced. Uh, the building had been cleaned. It was, you know, totally locked from, uh, from the rain, the water, I mean, everything that could have damaged the collections inside. And then we focused only on the collection. But yes, we did rely on AUB's administration and all the work was done in-house, either at AUB or from local, you know, um, in, uh, for example, for, for glass and ordering the glass, the wooden doors, everything was done locally, of course. Um, that um, I've just seen a, a question that's come up in the um, chat, which I'll ask now because it, um, it it sits with what we're talking about, I suppose, at the moment. Um, but someone's asked about um, disaster planning. Um, did you have a plan in place before this happened? Um, um, if you did, how has it changed? Um, wh what have you what have you learned from what's happened that would feed into that? Well, I have to admit that so when I took over, I did not have a uh, emergency plan. Um, but but the, the myself and the museum team had already followed. I mean, we had been we had some training in that uh, years earlier, so we had a pretty much good knowledge of how to handle this. And again, I have to admit that we were lucky. Uh, in this case, in that specific case for the AUB Museum, we were lucky to have limited, although the, the damage was is priceless, but it is limited 
in terms of uh, physical expansion. It was just under that showcase. It was one showcase. So somehow it was, um, we didn't have any water leakage. We didn't have any problems of gas. You know, we didn't have any of these structural problems be be besides the fact of the broken and, and shattered doors and windows that had to be secured for sure. But uh, again, uh, I think now, of course, we're working on a, <laughs> on, a, on a crisis management plan, for sure. No museum can survive without that. I, I don't think any of us would have seen um, what happened to you and, and what's happened with COVID coming, to be, to be honest. Um, um, uh, what, have you, what have you learnt about sustainability? Um, moving forward, how, how do you think what you're doing now and what you are looking to do in the future um, is future-proofing your museum? Well, basically cult cultural influences are increasingly really being recognized as important factors in long-term sustainability. This is what we heard in the earliest panel and I was very happy to hear that from your uh, panelists. Uh, basically, several parameters influence the quality of life, uh, health, jobs, education, cultural diversity, and environmental uh, quality. Um, this is the opportunity, I take it, to remind us all that natural and cultural heritage preservation is inherent to the 17 Sustainable Development Goals set by the United Nations for 2030. Uh, we have no choice but to achieve sustainability. To, to, for that, I mean, and to reach that end, we have to rely on three pillars. I've divided them into three pillars. Um, first one would be education, or maybe a more appropriate word would be transmission. I do think that museums have an important role in civic engagement. And this is the time to show our role and to activate it we can bring people together from uh, across differences and we can promote individual and collective engagement with the ideas and the issues of sustainability. This is our role. One tangible example <clears throat> is I've signed a partnership with uh, Air France, for example, who is working and introducing games on climate change uh, in our public programming. Uh, even though we are we're an archaeological museum, we, it is our duty to also highlight and create and build awareness around uh, these issues and, and environmental changes. Uh, the second pillar would be the operations. We ourselves as well uh, as museums, uh, we have a role as organizations in our own right. Uh, we need to adhere to sustainable practices in a way uh, in the way we undertake our own operations, for example, we can also serve as models of good practice. Um, we have a variety of, of activities, including the management of our resources, decision making and policy development. These are essential to set the right standards and to become models of good practices. Um, but in our case, being a university museum, we are always, of course, we have to be in line with the administration's policies. But luckily, when you are in an academic institution, you are closer to achieving sustainable goals uh, than, you know, let's say, uh, businesses or private companies or oil, oil and gas companies. I mean, there's nothing to compare, but just to tell you that somehow we are closer in this awareness than other institutions. And that's also a, a, a positive uh, thing. Uh, the third, if you want, a pillar would be the collections. Uh, we have to be aware we have a role in the sustainable development and management of our heritage collections. They are important national assets, whether we like it or not. And they are a legacy for future generations. However, they may become future liability if we fail to conserve and document with our long-term obligations and liabilities and keeping them in mind. So this, I think, is 
also one of our duties as museums from now on. Thank you. Um, my, my next question for you um, fits in quite nicely with um, a question we've just had from the audience. Um, I, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about how being part of an international community has supported you. And one of our um, colleagues in the audience has asked, how can we internationally help you? Um, that was a colleague from Latvia. Well, absolutely. Basically, I, I really do believe that ICOM International has offered us important support in terms of guidance. Uh, museums have undergone their own revolution uh, with the onset of the 21st century, shifting from purely scientific and research geared institutions to really platforms of communication and exchange. All at the AB Museum were late addressing these uh, new digital practices ourselves, it has somehow, it was somehow selfishly reassuring to notice that the rest of the world's museums uh, seem to be in need of recovery as well and of redefining their own raison d'etre. Uh, hence, if, you, if we look at the, this year's ICOMS poster, I think it's sending a very clear message the future of museums, recover and reimagine. This tells us one thing, we are not alone in this. I mean, for Lebanon, we know exactly what we are recovering from. We have a blast to recover from, we have an economic crisis to recover from or to survive because it's not over yet. But somehow, and that's why I use the word selfishly, uh, seeing that the rest of the world museum is also uh, is being challenged by the same challenges somehow uh, felt reassuring and gave us some kind of support. And yes, we're not alone. We have to redefine ourselves. We have to find reasons to continue and we have to find a meaning uh, for our collections to become truly and play the role of a legacy for the future. Um the fact that you've mentioned the future, I'm one, I was wondering for my last question before I go to um, any more of our audience's questions, was what are your hopes for the future of the museum? Where in five years time, in 10 years time, where, where do you hope to be? And, and perhaps your reply is going to be wrapped up in the future of Beirut and Lebanon too. But um, what, do, what do you see as your future? Well, first thing for me and the biggest challenge would be to really open up the museum, as I said, beyond security barriers. So for that, I am now in the process of applying to several grants in order to fund a mobile museum. Uh, that would actually, that would be an innovative way to deliver museum experiences to people, especially young people who do not have the opportunity or the luxury to visit museums in person. And, uh, and this will allow us to build awareness and reaching out through uh, to underprivileged communities. And I think this is highly needed in Lebanon. Uh, I, I want to move further away from museums being elitist or um, designed for an elitist group of people, but really be open to different groups and different societies and mainly underprivileged communities. And uh, this is where I see the museum going a few years down the road. And hopefully, and this, is a, this is the biggest challenge, is really having a direct access to the street, i.e. that the visitors won't have to actually cross the gates, but walk into the museum directly from the street and really have the museum play that role of a communication platform of exchange and awareness building and uh, you know that that's how I like to see the future of the museum. What a lovely idea and it, and it is strange isn't it how that um, that idea of, of uh, people having to come onto a campus does that that very sort of um, very obvious physical thing does have an impact on people does make people feel that perhaps it's it's not for them Absolutely, and that's why I said it's time to break with this uh, tradition of uh, 
even though it's not unintentional, but as you said, it's a physical barrier that you have to break and um, at least psychologically and, and allow, allow yourself to be open and, and to receive people in, 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 you know, I would like to, just like we turn the invitation on Zoom uh, user-friendly, I'd like to turn our visit, physical visit, user-friendly. Uh, so that people don't have to go through a lot of hassle and you know a logistical hassle to come into the museum and visit it freely. Um, that that actually the um, relationship with the university um, draws me to one of the questions that came in again from our audience, and. Um, one of our colleagues has asked if um, if the museum, uh, we had a day, I, I don't know whether you were able to join us, but we had a day on social justice yesterday. Um, and one of our colleagues has asked if being part of the American University um, of Beirut has any particular resonances around the decoloni uh, decolonizing debate, um, which we looked at in part yesterday. Well, that was the, the topic of my first lecture online with my colleague from the Harvard University of the Ancient Near East, because precisely, I mean, the, we have a lot of, we have similar collections to start with, we have similar past, and actually the Harvard Museum had bought some of his first uh, pieces from the AUB uh, Museum collections in the early 1800s, so, uh, or in the mid 1800s. So uh, indeed, that was one of the major topics, but um, not as much as I would say European museums when it comes to decolonization. Um, it, it's, it's more complex. I would say we have to open up a political debate to explain and, you know, to, to be fair, to, to answer fairly this question. You cannot separate the presence of an, the American University of Beirut from the perception that people in the Middle East have of the United States. So this is, that's why I say it's a very complex question. And I think it takes, we need time to really discuss it openly and uh, um, without taboos, so to speak. Thank you, Ince. I'll just have a look. Yeah, I can't see anything that I that I haven't covered, but I'm sure my colleagues will remind me quickly if if I have. So. Um, I really, really hope we can have an opportunity um, to catch up again in a few years' time and see and see how um, see how many of your hopes and dreams for the future that you've uh, you've managed to achieve. I, I think from from everything we've seen today, I think um, you seem to be on such a such a strong path to um to getting those things done and to achieving those goals so um it's been a really uh, powerful and uplifting session I, I saw some colleagues had said uh, had mentioned in the chat that they found the film a very emotional one um but as i say a very uplifting one as well and um thank you so much for that nadine Thank you, Claire. Really, if I would like to end on, on one note, uh, really what, what um, today, even though I found it to be an insurmountable uh, challenge when I started, uh, today I look at it, uh, I look at it as a chance to take a leap of faith beyond hate, fear, and despair. And this is what we did. We started a journey of commitment and perseverance and repair, one step at a time baby steps, and that usually pays off. This has been my humble experience. Thank you very much for having me. No, it's been it's been absolutely wonderful. And, it, and it's been so lovely to see, um, as I said at the start, we all remember seeing the pictures on the news of that, um, that explosion. And it, it was certainly for me, it, it was one of the most incredible things and shocking things that I, I'd ever seen. And, uh, and to be able to speak to you now 
and and hear everything that you've been able to do and everything you've been able to achieve has has just been wonderful and um and i think something that i really uh, will take away from this is um is that idea of working together of working in partnership and and it's not a surprise that it's come up in the chat that people are offering help and and support um, because I think that's one of the things we do really well in the museum and cultural sector. I think um, we're all we're all there to help each other if we can. And um, and I hope that if um, I hope you won't mind that if anybody wants to contact you or be in touch about what you're doing, um, then then I hope you will you'll allow us to share your details. Thank you so much. Of course, thank you so much. <laughs> Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, finished on time, what a result. Um, so now um, we're going to take a break for lunch and we'll hope to see you at uh, two o'clock for our Barker Langham curated session. Um, today, we're looking at responsive futures. How do museums or cultural institutions collect amid chaos and disquiet? And that's going to be with Jody Neal, um, senior consultant at Barker Langham. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to that session. I hope you'll all join us. And thank you again very much to Nadine and to all of you for taking part today.